Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this should be a great uh, and exciting topic to discuss today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we have some great uh, speakers. Uh, first off, we want to thank uh, Depew Synthes, who has uh, generously provided an educational grant uh, for us to help provide this uh, educational opportunity. So we want to thank them uh, so much for, for helping to support this. Um, we're very fortunate today. We've got two uh, recognized experts in the field of rib plating to uh, kind of walk us through some techniques and talk about some uh, ins and outs of how they uh, do this and how they uh, deal with difficult cases. Uh, first off, we've got uh, Tom White, who's actually my partner here in uh, Utah uh, from Intermountain Medical Center, and uh, Fred Paracci from uh, Denver Health in Denver, Colorado. What we're going to do, the format's going to go like this. Uh, we'll turn the time over to uh, White, uh, Dr. White here for uh, the first part, where he's going to talk about a little bit about patient selection and some uh, techniques of uh, placing the plates. We've got some good videos to show. And then uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Paracci after that for sort of the uh, fractures at the margins is kind of the, the topic we came up with, uh, difficult anatomy or, or, or hard places to get to, and, uh, and a little bit about dealing with post-op complications in, in management. Um, to start off, uh, I have a question here for the audience. So if you can look on your screen, the um, question is, do you currently perform rib plating in your practice? So go ahead and take a second to answer yes or no. And um, we'll go ahead and... Okay, whoops, I think I maybe I went too far and these are starting to play out here. So it looks like a good uh, maybe, you know, two-thirds to three-fourths do perform rib fracture plating in their current practice, so that's interesting. Next question I have for the, for the whole audience here is, if you currently perform rib plating, which system do you use? And you can check any that you use. And it looks like most of us are using the synthes plate, so very interesting. Okay, well, to start off here, let me turn the time over to Dr. White to talk about rib fracture stabilization, selection, and uh, technique. Uh, thank you, Dave and Matt, for the uh, opportunity to uh, join you guys today. Um, I th uh, can you let's advance to the next slide, and uh, you guys can see my disclosures. Next, please. Uh, this is a case um, from Monday this week. Uh, it was it's contemporary and uh, illustrative of a, of a of a fairly typical patient that we encounter uh, not uncommonly on our trauma service, as many of you do. You'll notice from the um, CAT scan on the right that the patient has multiple left-sided rib fractures. There's a distinct posterior fracture line. There's an anterior fracture line, and there's some lateral fractures more proximal. And if we use a the radiographic definition of flail, which is most of us would recognize as uh, two two rib two consecutive ribs fractured in two or more places, this patient actually has two separate flail segments. So I don't think anyone would argue that this patient has flail chest by the by the the rec the most uh, common criteria. But but interestingly, this patient was not in in physiologic distress. He um, you can see some distortion of his left and some flattening of his left chest wall contour uh, on his plane radiograph. And this was a patient who was highly motivated to resume uh, vigorous exercise activity. This is a skier who, who ran into a stump and uh, uh, a physical therapist by practice and, and was highly motivated to, uh, to recover quickly and resume an active lifestyle. So we offered this patient an operation based on uh, on uh, several criteria, and that's sort of what I want to talk about today. But I, the the one point is that the radiographic uh, definition of flail and the clinical definition of flail, which is of course the paradoxical uh, motion with uh, spontaneous ventilation, is oftentimes don't necessarily correlate very well. And I think we we uh, our current definitions of flail, which is our most common indication for rib fracture repair, is 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 inadequate and needs some work. So I, I'd, I'd, I'll start by saying that most patients with flail chest or all patients with flail chest who don't have significant contraindications should be considered candidates for rib fracture repair uh, in, uh, in, our, in our view. And flail chest remains the, uh, the most common indication and occurs in about two-thirds of the patients that we operate on. Uh, on. Another recognized indication uh, published in multiple sources but 
but again, uh, without a lot of data, uh, is a is a three or more displaced fracture uh, indication. Uh, and we see a fair number of these patients. It's rare for us to operate on a patient with uh, uh, less than three fractures, although I, I must say in select cases we have certainly done that. Patients who are medic optimally medically managed with, um, with multimodal um, pain therapies and uh, respiratory therapies, uh, et cetera, and, and, and fail, whichever, diagnose, whichever um, criteria you use for that uh, label, those patients are, would, would need to be considered uh, candidates if their anatomy is conducive to repair. There are, more, there are other more, um, a bit more esoteric and rare indications, organ impalement, for example, the rare open fracture of the, of the ribs, and then what I've labeled drive-by thoracotomy. Uh, once or twice a year, we're doing a thoracotomy for another reason, and, and uh, there, are, there are concomitant rib fractures, and those, it would, it was, it's logical to repair those uh, while you're there. Uh, the contraindications are, um, are relatively few. The patient with a bad brain injury should not be in the operating room getting their ribs fixed in, in most circumstances. Uh, as many of these patients uh, have, you know, questionable survivability and uh, and ICP issues, and uh, I, this remains the, the the primary contraindication. The unstable spine is another area where we oftentimes will delay repair or even um, forego repair uh, until uh, until and unless the uh, the spine has been uh, stabilized surgically. So that's Fred. Do you have any comments about those uh, definitions? I think that's great. I agree with you with each of them. The next uh, order of business here is a is a video that we shot a couple of years ago. Um, it's a and I it's about eight minutes long. We're just going to run it in its entirety and comment over the top, and uh, we'll uh, illustrate sort of the basic uh, tech uh, steps in in rib fracture repair. So um, the uh, pl incision placement is is challenging uh, sometimes. So we like to minimize our incision length and make sure that it's uh, positioned to, to allow us uh, the best access to the ribs that we want to repair. Uh, this is a pretty generous incision. This is longer than our average incision, but it's a, it, it makes for a nice video. The small keyhole incisions are hard to see what's going on underneath. It looks like we're operating fast. That's a, that's a high altitude phenomenon. It's, there's less wind resistance. It, in Salt Lake City, so we do operate faster. Fred's even faster than this in Denver, but um, we uh, we will typically make some skin flaps. Um, although I must say we flap less than we used to, uh, but this does allow the uh, you to move the incision around to to uh, to expose the the ribs uh, that your that your index ribs. The, hey, Tom, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, yeah, I lost the video on mine. I'm um, just wondering if other people also are unable to see it. Just getting a black box on my screen. Maybe it's just me. Uh, yeah, it's coming through okay on ours. Sometimes if the connection speed is slower, it'll it'll be a black box on your screen. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I apologize for those with the black box, but uh, there's an, a, an extremely elegant video playing uh, right now with uh, masterfully done. Anyway, this the self-retaining retractor, the book Walter uh, is is the one we use. It can be very helpful. If you don't have uh, uh, many assistants to help you, the, the the ribs are generally pretty easy to palpate if you're uh, if they're displaced, and even if they're not, you can you can uh, you can find them. This is the, the latissimus muscle, and we were loath to to divide this muscle or cut it uh, in any uh, orientation except longitudinally uh, longitudinally like this. We split the muscle, um, and typically uh, do that over the fr fractures. Fortunately for us, rib fractures occur in in alignment. Typically, there's usually a fracture a, a, a line, and so splitting the muscle over the top of the middle of the line allows you to access uh, several ribs, uh, usually two or three, or or maybe even four ribs uh, at one location. So uh, there seems to be almost no morbidity involved in splitting the latissimus. We close that uh, over the top at the completion of the plating. The underlying serratus muscle. Those fibers run parallel with the ribs uh, in general and, and can be spread uh, without division as well. 
We next uh, we expose the fracture. This is not a displaced fracture, so I, I'm not going to show you re reduction, but that's typically done with a right angle clamp, uh, 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 gently elevating or sometimes forcefully elevating the, the depressed segment. And usually you can get the two edges of the rib to perch and stay in position. Um, uh, I've cleaned, we're, we've cleaned the rib here of quite a bit of its periosteum. This is a little more aggressive than we would ordinarily do now, but uh, you do want to be able to uh, identify the rib margins so that you your or, your hardware is or, oriented, uh, it's centered on the rib. <clears throat> this is a measuring caliper to determine rib depth. Most people's ribs are 9, 10, 11 millimeters in diameter. The screw length is uh, selected based on the on the rib depth. I don't measure every rib every time. I usually get a, a reading and then maybe recheck the reading again if I've moved uh, more than one or two ribs away, but uh, it's generally pretty stable. If it's a 10 millimeter screw on the ninth rib, it's generally the same on the fifth rib. Um, there's, there's very, there are various clamps that um, hold the prosthetic on the rib. Uh, I like the right angle clamp like this. I don't always ratchet it down. I, oftentimes I'm just holding it uh, closed just enough to, to uh, keep it in that position. And then uh, the plating systems are all a little bit different. This is the Depew Synthes Matrix rib, and it involves uh, pre-drilling, which you just saw there. Uh, that uh, that guide, drill guide keeps you from drilling too deeply, uh, but the goal here is to drill both through the outer and the inner table, the inner outer and inner cortex, both of which are quite thin, but you can easily feel them when you're drilling, and then uh, and then placing the, the locking screw into the hole. Whether you do multiple rib, uh, screws on one rib or one side of the rib and then switch over, or whether you alternate or start at one end uh, or in the middle, I don't think makes any difference whatsoever. It's uh, I think that's all surgeon preference. You can see there the the the, the drill as it pops through the outer and then the inner cortex. It's important to lock these screws down nice and tight so that they don't um, uh, migrate. They're not lag screws. They will not pull the bone up and hold it to the rib. These these this is like an external fixator. Uh, the the, uh, the the entire design is is um, is dependent on the locking of the screws to the rib itself. And all of the current systems use a locking screw technique as, as far as I'm aware. You try, uh, Fred, why don't you uh, make a few comments? Uh, sure. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I, I can't see the video. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I, I will, just based on what you're saying, uh, make one small point, which is that uh, all of the systems come with uh, rescue screws, uh, which are non-locking screws. So if you are having trouble getting the plate flush with the rib, um, you can use a screw that won't lock down and, and you actually keep turning it until the plate is flush with the rib and that helps you position it and then you put two or three locking screws in to get your stable construct and then at the end you can remove the non-locking one and replace it with a locking screw. So in the end yep. you you would preferably have all locking screws but you can use a non-locker as kind of an adjunct to get the app position of the plate to the rib which is critical. Yes, and I think it's important that the, uh, to, to mention that that apposition needs to be done without any significant tension on the on the construct. These these plates are relatively flexible and they will deform uh, but if there's a if they're if they're flexed significantly um, and held in that position with the screws, the screws will could pu could pull out fairly readily. The the rib the strength of the rib is is uniquely weak. Uh, the cortex being only a, a millimeter or a millimeter and a half in in, uh, in thickness. So it's important that the shape of the plate matches as closely as possible the shape of the ribs. Is that does that make sense? So there are bending tools so that you can put the proper amount of uh, curve, the proper amount of in-plane bending, which we refer to as the smile or the frown, depending on the which rib you're um, you're matching it to. And then some of these uh, ribs can have a fair amount of twist and uh, over the course of the rib, and uh, you need to match that as well. But that's all fairly easy to do. Um, 
the, these ribs that you're, what you're seeing here are, are pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of displacement. Uh, there's no significant gap. You, you, it's important to avoid a significant gap. I don't know what the magic number is for uh, for the uh, a gap that's excessive, but but if you uh, in general, if the if you have apposition of the two rib edge edges with uh, the, um, within a millimeter or two of each other, uh, I think those will heal uh, most of the time uneventfully. Gaps that are larger than a few millimeters, though, uh, make me nervous, and we um, we don't tolerate those in general. Um, it's okay to approach the rib from below with a clamp, even though the neurovascular bundle is there, as long as you uh, enter the, the jaw of your clamp uh, is uh, is well uh, well away or well inferior to the bundle. Um, the the importance of putting well vascularized, healthy muscle uh, back on top of your of your construct, I don't think can be overstated. I think it's the one of the primary reasons that the failure and infection rate in rib fracture repair is is, uh, is quite low compared with uh, hardware placement in some other areas of the body, particularly the the distal lower extremity where there, where you don't have that luxury. So um, that's, that's uh, there's, takes us eight minutes to fix three ribs. There you go. We're pretty fast. So um, uh, uh, final comments. This was, uh, it's, it's, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a comment or two about incision placement. Generally, most patients we use a single incision, but it's not that uncommon to use uh, more than one incision. And uh, the classic laterally uh, or horizontally based uh, thor uh, thoracic incision is not is is the workhorse. But we oftentimes will use a, a vertical incision if that gives us the best exposure with the with the shortest length of of incision. So uh, muscle sparing uh, is, is certainly possible in in all cases, and um, we'll drain that subcutaneous space if we uh, if we made significant flaps more and more. I do I do less and less of the subcutaneous drainage, and we have not had a problem with seromas. We put a chest tube in every patient at the completion at, at a remote site, inferior and anterior to our incision, typically, and uh, lavage the pleural space through the chest tube with a liter or two of saline to make sure that all the hemothorax is is um is uh con is washed out and then uh uh another useful adjunct at the com completion of the technique is uh is a, is a rib block and that can be done with paravertebral catheter placement at surgery or more commonly and recently for us we use we're using the liposomal bupivacaine preparation and, and performing rib blocks uh, on the way out. So I think I'll stop my comments there. Fred, any uh, comments about the video? I mean, I guess you didn't see the video too much, <laughs> but uh, any comments about his, uh, Dr. White's thoughts or anything that you would add to that? Well, uh, why don't we um, switch over to my slides? I, I think I'm going to touch up upon a lot of the, the same things, uh, but uh, no, in general, that's great. Um, Okay. Well, good. Let me. Uh, I got a couple more audience poll questions here. Uh, so first one is uh, just curious. Have you ever taken a formal course in rib fracture fixation? And we'll let you uh, answer there. And it looks like uh, that's interesting. You know, pretty evenly split, but a slight majority towards no formal fixation. Next question, uh, did you learn rib fracture plating, plating techniques during your residency or fellowship? We'll see how that one plays, yeah. That's interesting. I, it'd be interesting to do the same survey uh, 10 years from now as more and more people are doing the, the technique. I think, uh, I think we'll see these numbers be different. And then last question, uh, this, is a, this is a Likert scale. I feel completely comfortable approaching rib fractures in difficult locations, under the scapula, close to the sternum, close to the spine, so on and so forth. We'll see. So again, the interesting numbers here. It looks like uh, some of us are very comfortable, some are not, and uh, everything in between. So very interesting. All right, well, with that, uh, Fred, uh, you're up. Oh, great. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be involved with this, uh, especially uh, with the guys over at Intermountain. Uh, 
who have really been leading the way in developing uh, this operation. Um, so I, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, you can see my disclosures uh, there. Next slide. Uh, I want to take the next few minutes uh, to expand upon what Tom uh, described in terms of the technique and um, outline some of the uh, positioning and incision uh, developments that we've made here over the last uh, few years, mostly uh, by uh, doing things the wrong way and then realizing that there may be a better way to do it. Uh, and I particularly want to uh, discuss my approach to very anterior and very posterior fractures, uh, which can be challenging. Uh, and then uh, Tom uh, touched on some of the post-op stuff, but I'll uh, expand on how we handle the pleural space intra-op and post-operatively in, in our current approach to analgesia. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's start with the anterior fractures. Uh, this is a pretty common uh, location for fractures, and um, the challenge is uh, exposure. If you're doing a traditional posterior lateral thoracotomy, uh, they're probably going to be pretty far away from you medially. Um, they're close to the costal cartilage, so the issue of how you fix those to the medial fragment, whether you put the plate into the cartilage or you put the plate into the sternum or you put the plate all the way over to the contralateral rib. Uh, and then I just put a bullet point on indications for repair, and you'll find, I'm sure many of you already have found that once the word gets out that you're interested in rib repair, you start getting all kinds of crazy consults, and we've gotten a handful now of patients who have received CPR in the medical ICU and have basically anterior flails, and um, the fractures are quite displaced, and the question is, is there going to be any benefit to um, repairing those surgically? And uh, you just have to be careful to make sure you can technically do the operation, but what the patient's long-term uh, prognosis is, if they're going to be on a ventilator with an anoxic brain injury, uh, there's probably not much utility in, in fixing the anterior rib fractures. Next slide, please. Um, so we now approach these uh, in the supine position, uh, and uh, we hang the ipsilateral arm. We get a candy cane stirrup. Again, we're at the county hospital in Denver here, so we don't have anything too fancy. Uh, but we get some coban and an ace wrap and uh, hang that arm up so that someone can stand above the operating surgeon and man the retractor or even uh, the drill uh, to get the very inferior and medial fractures. And if you are approaching an anterior flail and you are planning to do bilateral rib repair, you can hang both of the arms so that someone could stand above you on each side. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then just going back to some netter drawings, I uh, can click next, please. I think some should show up there. Yep. Um, to get the third, fourth, and fifth ribs, uh, we use a subpectoral incision. So. Uh, mirroring the pec in a man and the inframammary fold in a female, that gives a pretty good cosmetic result. And we just raise a flap right underneath the pectoralis and uh, approach those fractures in that way. And then the, the second rib um, is a little tricky to get. It's kind of way off in a hole in a tunnel from the subpectoral incision. So we'll just make a oblique incision right under the clavicle and then split the fibers of the pectoralis major. And then uh, next click, please. Same thing with the pec minor, uh, which gets you right down on the ribs without having to take any muscle. And uh, as long as you're medial enough, uh, there's really no danger of hitting the long thoracic nerve through this approach. So it's relatively uh, nice avascular planes and free of anything uh, serious to hurt. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here are just some pictures on the left of a uh, scapular retractor underneath the pectoralis and a right angle drill uh, getting some screws into a uh, I think this was a fourth uh, rib fracture anteriorly. And then on the right there is just a patient who we did two through five anteriorly on the left side, and you can see the small little subclavicular incision and then the inframammary one. And uh, don't pay any attention to the fact that he has a tracheostomy. Uh, next click, please. Uh, there's another patient who we did bilateral repairs on. I promise not everyone gets a tracheostomy who we, who we operate on. Uh, some newer things are becoming available, which are pretty neat, uh, and this, a lot of this stuff has been done in collaboration with uh, surgeons, both trauma and orthopedic surgeons, but here's an example of a plate that is contoured specifically for um, repairing an anterior fracture uh, with fixation to the sternum. Uh, this is a unicortical plating system where um, you don't have to measure rib or sternal depth uh, 
and you don't have to worry about going uh, through both cortices into something like uh, the pericardium or the heart. Um, and uh, so there's uh, this kind of stuff uh, in the not too distant future. This is actually available now. Um, and I think that um, some of us, including myself, have plated the cartilage in the past or cerclage to it. And I've just never really got the feeling that there's a whole lot of stability there. So um, I think that um, when you can, uh, the right thing to do is to put the medial uh, plate fixed to the sternum. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Okay, so that was anterior fractures. Now we'll go to the other end of the rib and talk about posterior fractures. There aren't a lot of great data looking at anterior fractures specifically, but we do know a few things about what happens to posterior fractures. And for a variety of reasons, including uh, the pull of the serratus anterior, uh, posterior fractures are prone to interval displacement. And I don't know if any of you guys have had a patient like this one, but uh, John Mayberry sent me these uh, chest x-rays one of his patients had a relatively normal looking x-ray here. And then if you click next, please, um, four or five days later, same patient, um, very different x-ray with severely displaced uh, posterior lateral rib fractures. Um, next slide, please. And these same forces in conjunction with the fact that the rib bends back there, making it tough to get a very good fit of uh, contouring the plate to the rib, uh, predispose a plate failure uh, at this location, and this has happened to me. Uh, here's a picture of a plate that popped off a posterior lateral rib fracture. It almost always pops off on the lateral side from the serratus pulling on the rib. And on the right, you can just see a CAT scan showing that one of the screws ended up uh, down um, in the subcutaneous tissue in the muscle. And this was an incarcerated patient who was doing some, some pull-ups about a week after his surgery and, and felt a pop. Um, so it's good that he was doing pull-ups, but not good that one of his plates popped off, and we ended up just observing it and not removing it. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, Silvana Morosco, who's a thoracic surgeon in Australia who's done a lot of work with rib repair, looked at her failures and um, found that almost all of the posterior plates, all, almost all the failures occurred in the posterior position. So this is a challenging area to uh, get the plates to function properly and not become dislodged. Next slide, please. The other issue uh, that happens besides the pull um, is uh, known as bony bridging. So here's a 3D recount of a patient with a flail chest uh, for whom the anterior fracture series was plated. And you can see those over on the lateral side there. And the posterior fracture line was not. And when you have severely displaced posterior fractures because the ribs are so close to each other back there, uh, the fragments don't know that their neighbor is uh, lateral as opposed to superior or inferior, and they'll start to heal to each other, and the result will just be a long line of callus, which inhibits the bucket handle mechanism and can lead to a restrictive type lung disease as well as chronic pain. So I think um, if you have very displaced posterior fractures, uh, this just really um, further underscores the rationale for fixing them. Next slide, please. Um, so it's prudent to fix them, but it's challenging to do so. The transverse process is right there, and you can see the fracture on the top is going to be hard to approach, at least from the outside, because it's right flush with the costa transverse junction and joint. And then the rib makes an angle there. If you can click next, please. Um, there's a pre-contoured plate on the left there, and on the right is the bend that was necessary to get it uh, put uh, flush with the uh, angle in the tubercle of the rib. So you really have to bend it a good 30 to 35, sometimes even 40 degrees to match the contour. Uh, next click, please. Um, sorry, uh, one back. Uh, and then finally, uh, the posterior fracture series are usually located right under the scapula. So you have to figure out a way to get the scapula um, out of the way to expose the fractures um, or alternatively fix the fractures from the inside. Uh, next slide, please. So we, uh, about uh, eight months ago, uh, started approaching all of these uh, from the prone position, and uh, I know that uh, Tom uh, does this as well. Um, so we'll position the patient prone and then uh, have the ipsilateral arm on a Mayo stand that's about six inches lower than the rest of the patient on the table. And what this does is allow lateralization of the scapula, and you can get a good six to eight centimeters of lateralization of the scapula away from the midline uh, to get it out of the way so that you don't have to retract it. Uh, next slide, please. 
And this is from an old thoracic textbook. Um, I make my incision over the triangle of auscultation. Uh, I make it quite a bit smaller than is shown there, and that exposure is quite an exaggeration. But basically, you raise a flap under the trapezius, a flap under the latissimus, and then get under the scapula. Uh, next slide, please. We also use a pediatric book walter, and you can see that uh, exposure gets you right down on the um, paraspinous uh, muscles, which you can then raise a flap under uh, and expose your ribs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in that way, you can get um, pretty posterior on the ribs. Um, so uh, Tom brought up the issue of unstable spine fractures. We've now done, uh, I think, five cases with unstable thoracic spine fractures and um, unilateral displaced posterior lateral fractures of the ribs. And um, we've done these five cases in conjunction with our spine team. If you can go to the next slide, please. So we'll position the patient prone, which is one advantage of the prone approach, which is that it's the same approach that the spine surgeons use in general. And the spine guys came in and did the posterior pedicle uh, construct, and then they closed their incision, and we scrubbed in and, and made our triangle of auscultation incision and fixed the ribs at the same time. I think probably best to stabilize the spine before the ribs, uh, but at any rate, uh, we did them both at the same time. I'm also curious to know if you prone patients, if it improves their pulmonary mechanics in the same way that it does in, in the ICU, but um, as far as I know, no one's studied that specifically yet. Next slide, please. Okay, um, Tom, I don't know if you want to chime in uh, about anything about anterior or posterior fractures before we move on? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, when I present rib repair to patients and their families, I present it as a thoracic tune-up uh, during which we accomplished four goals. Um, we accomplished pulmonary toilet uh, via bronchoscopy. We examine and evacuate the pleural space. We put in good directed local regional anesthesia, and Tom mentioned all these things. Um, and then we also perform the rib repair. Um, but it's more than just going to fix the ribs. And it's not really clear to what extent each one of those in contributes to improved outcomes, but in my mind it doesn't really matter because you do them all every time. So the pleural space um, is your friend. Um, we routinely now at the end of the operation uh, stick a scope in and evacuate retained hemothorax under direct vision, and we do guided um, also liposomal bupivacaine uh, rib blocks. Um, and then um, I have a few slides showing the couple cases we've done where we've actually put the plates uh, on the inside and done a thoracoscopic uh, rib repair. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these are hopefully going to be some videos, or I don't know if, if that'll work. But basically, um, I wanted to. Let me let me try here. Uh, okay. If, Otherwise, if I'm happy to just. Uh, it's just playing on the my screen. There. Yeah, it's playing on my screen now. If you want to. Oh, you mama. Saying? I'm not seeing it, um, but I can I can talk through it. Um, okay. So the counter argument to bronchoscopy is that it takes forever, okay, we're not gonna um, that but if you out. keep doing it every time and the team's ready and has a scope okay. set up for you, it really only adds five to ten minutes. Um, and we've found pus down there, uh, we found mucus plugs, we found blood oh, plugs, mama. There, occluding the left main stem bronchus. And after we clean that all out, uh, we just thread down an easy blocker, okay, bronchial blocker. Out and uh, should have a video of that. I don't know if maybe that one's playing now or not. Uh, just loading the blood. blood clot one next. Okay. In the airway. So we're seeing the blood clot at the carina. Clot. Yep. Uh, so anyway, my point is we're down there for the bronch anyway. Uh, so threading down this bronchial blocker really just adds another minute or two, um, and that's how we achieve our lung isolation to do the thoracoscopy at, at the conclusion of the operation. You can see here, and uh, again, this is my you can see here how it helps to be four at least four centimeters from the vagina, I mean carina, so that the spring action. Balloons just float uh, going up on the block. Oh, good. And then you try to fill it up. Yep. Make sure to fill it up all the way. And Pump it up so it's hard. Every time. <laughs> Great. Uh, so Tom alluded to this technique, uh, but didn't mention that uh, it's published. Uh, so his group wrote up uh, their experience with routine uh, irrigation and evacuation of the pleural space during rib repair and showed that it significantly uh, reduced uh, 
the incidence of retained uh, hemothorax and empyema. Uh, so they're counter to a lot of the things I do. They, there's actually some data to support uh, routinely getting into and evacuating the pleural space during rib repair. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is a photograph from my colleague uh, Eric Peltz, who's at University of Colorado, and uh, they were putting some rib plates in, and they incidentally discovered a six-centimeter injury to the right diaphragm, which they repaired. Uh, they have another one uh, showing a left diaphragm injury, uh, but certainly um, incidentally or not incidentally diagnosing and treating other intrathoracic pathologies like um, uh, diaphragm injury or, or lung injury is an advantage to routinely uh, investigating the pleural space. Next slide, please. And um, there are a lot of different ways to achieve local regional anesthesia. I think that local regional anesthesia is mandatory in a patient with a severe chest wall injury. Um, we, for the longest time, did put in these on-cue pain pumps, not only in our rib repair patients, but also in all rib fracture patients who are admitted to the hospital. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we never felt super confident that we were getting it in the right place, uh, at least when we did it by anatomic landmarks, outside of the context of a rib repair. And uh, the patients uh, were not huge fans of it. So. Um, we have moved away from them, although um, I do think it's still a, an acceptable way to provide local regional anesthesia. And next slide, please. Uh, we've started putting uh, liposomal bupivacaine in um, with a 7-inch uh, spinal needle uh, during our thoracoscopy. And just to remind everyone, I know everyone knows this already, but the intercostal bundle is really underneath the um, external and internal intercostal muscles. So when you're placing that pain catheter in, um, you're really putting it in the subscapular space, and there are a couple muscle layers that are between the um, medicine and the rib and the nerve. Uh, so I think that putting it subpleural thoracoscopically or open um, is a more effective means of uh, anesthetizing the nerve versus being in that subscapular space. Uh, next slide, please. I think of, uh, the thing I haven't mentioned is epidural for local regional anesthesia, thoracic epidural, but I think um, we, have, we all have our horror stories with that, that it's hard to get someone to put it in, and there are all kinds of contraindications. So that's kind of our last resort. Um, I'll take the last minute or two just to mention uh, the concept of intrapleural plates, uh, thoracoscopic. And of course, uh, there are several theoretical advantages that are mirrored in the elective thoracic literature such as minimizing incisions and muscle division. You don't need to retract the scapula. You have wide exposure to the limits of fractures, uh, including the anterior and posterior ones that I mentioned. And then um, theoretically, um, if you're drilling from the inside out versus the other way around, you would minimize the chance of um, lacerating the lung or the pericardium or heart. And then uh, we have had one patient where we had to remove the plates because they were he was very skinny and could feel them. Um, and they bothered him, so we removed it, and you would theoretically that that would be less of a problem or not a problem if the plates were on the other side. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some images from uh, the original case report that we did of this uh, showing the port placement. This patient presented with four um, severely displaced lateral fractures, and we kind of surrounded the fractures with four plates and then got in and used a carter Thomason suture passer and a number five ethabon to come around the rib fragments on each side and pull up on them through little stab incisions to achieve reduction. And then uh, through some um, MacGyvering, we contoured the plate uh, in the opposite direction and then used a right angle screwdriver to uh, uh, drill and screwdriver to drill the, the holes and, and place the screws. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yep, next one. And there's just the post-operative x-ray with the screws going in the opposite direction, and, and he did okay. And, and we've done a couple more now, and uh, a lot of different people um, uh, are, are having discussions with industry to really refine the tools uh, to accomplish this. Um, things being discussed are even as crazy as, as the robot, uh, which would give you that 360-degree articulation, which you would need on the screwdrivers and the drills to mirror the, the concavity of the, of the ribs from the inside. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's all I had to say. Um, so back to you guys. Okay, great. Wow, fantastic. So weird to see those screws go in the other direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so next up I've got another quick question and then we'll, we'll open it up for some audi audience uh, direct questions. Uh, so for everyone, uh, in terms of utilization of rib fracture plating in general, do you feel that rib plating is being performed too frequently, not frequently enough, or appropriately frequently? And I think we may be uh, preaching to the choir a little bit here with this question, but uh, <laughs> yeah, not a, not a shocker that uh, we're probably, we all think it's probably not done enough. Okay, um, before we open it up to audience questions, just a quick technical note. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can send us a question. Uh, you can use the chat function, which is over on the left-hand side of your screen. If you don't see a place to type, there's a little, uh, like a cartoon speaking bubble icon that you can click on, and it'll open up the chat function. Um, you can click on the raise your hand button, which is also uh, uh, available in that same region. And um, we will do our best to call on you. And then, uh, if you can just, if, if you if you've called in on a phone number, if you can let us know what your phone number is through the chat function, then we can unmute you so you can uh, ask the question. So, Matt, any questions so far? Uh, yeah. So our first question is from Brad Thomas, who apparently has screaming kids in the background, so we can't unmute him. Um, he wants to know: Do you guys routinely uh, use drains? After, if you have to raise those flaps to prevent a seroma, uh, we'll, we'll start with that one first. He actually has two questions, but why don't you go ahead and address the drains for when you're raising the flaps? Uh, yes. Uh, in my early early experience, uh, we drained. I drained everyone because I flapped everyone. I had an early uh, seroma uh, and a couple of early hematomas, so I was leery of those in proximity to the hardware but as as this as the technique has evolved I flap less and I drain less yeah I uh, agree with that and one thing we haven't talked about is what type of drain we use and uh, I actually uh, converted over based on uh, Dr. White's uh, uh, practice from a rigid uh, 24 French tube thoracostomy to a 19 French Blake drain that I leave in the pleural space, assuming there's no large laceration to the lung that's leaking air out. If I just if I'm routinely in the pleural space during a rib repair, I'll put a 19 French Blake in that I think is silastic, so it's just not as uncomfortable for the patient and you can pull it out you know a day or two later. Um, and I if I'm really raising huge flaps, I'll put something in the subcutaneous uh, tissue, but um, I'd say that's like 5% of the time, and uh, knock on wood, I haven't had issues with uh, hematomas or seromas uh, uh, without using a drain. Okay, and uh, I think we have a question from Mark Newell. Mark, are you on the line? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I have a patient uh, who's probably going on his fourth week in the hospital, an ATV crash, um, rip fractures on the left side, one through 10, badly displaced, fell chest. But he came in with pretty significant pulmonary contusions, so developed acute respiratory failure pretty quickly. He also had a thoracic spine fracture, which the neurosurgeons eventually decided to repair. He's uh, done well from a pain standpoint. He's off the ventilator, probably will be going to rehab pretty soon but he still has a badly uh, deformed left chest. And I'm wondering, with him being so far out, is this someone that you would repair during this hospital stay, or would you evaluate him after rehab when he's perhaps a little bit stronger and, and maybe able to handle the operation better? Oh, Mark, that's a tough one. Uh, the four weeks, uh, at four weeks, it's, uh, it's, it's extremely challenging in my experience to operate on these patients I, we've had to do that a couple of times or we've we've embarked on that uh a couple of times um uh they start to get hard at about uh, uh oh, 12 to 18 days somewhere in that neighborhood that the amount of callus that's formed and the inflammatory reaction uh, uh is quite intense and and but it's certainly doable um i would probably offer that gentleman a repair before he uh, before he leaves, I'm um, interested to see what Fred would say about that. Yeah, that's a great question, and there's no uh, you know evidence-based uh, answer. But I would echo that it's going to be technically difficult. Uh, you're going to have to go in there and feel like you're refracturing a lot of the ribs. You will be refracturing them, and it's going to bleed quite a bit. And um, I, I think 
that probably um, repairing them would give him benefit in the long term, but I would find it difficult to take a guy who's kind of slowly improving and on his way out the door to rehab and then do a big operation on him, which may set him back. So uh, yeah. quite honestly, I might I might just let things simmer down for a little bit and then see how he looks in a month or two. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, how about Rich Lesperance? Are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. So uh, my questions are, uh, number one, at, at what point – after uh, admission, do you typically look at taking these patients uh, to the to the OR to fix their ribs? Uh, obviously, you mentioned the spine needs to be fixed and, and you need the respiratory function a little better. Uh, but are you looking two to three days after admission? Uh, I heard the upper limit of 12 days there. And uh, secondly, do you wait for people to fail to prove that their their flail segment or their multiple defects are going to are going to harm them? Or do you try to push to fix everybody who it looks like is going to have a significant flail defect? Well, I'll tackle that one at first. Uh, I, I'm certainly on the aggressive side, and I I, I don't know, Tom, maybe you, you can say what your record is, but my record is uh, 37 minutes from the trauma bay to the operating room to get the ribs <laughs> plated. Um, and uh, it's a great question. Uh, we're trying to look at it now in a multi-institutional uh, study of uh, three groups of people if they get their fixation within 24 hours, between 24 and 48 hours, and then between 48 and 96 hours, I think. Um, so I think in general earlier is better. I think I, I disagree with the concept of let's give them a trial, and if they fail, let's go plate the ribs. Um, in most cases, I think you can um, – through a combination of demographic data like age and comorbidities, physiologic data like their IS and respiratory rate and cough, and radiographic data like um, some of those films that Tom showed of the flail chest, predict within the first couple hours how someone's going to do. And to let someone sit around for three or five days and continue to deteriorate and get intubated and then say, okay, this guy's not doing well, let's take him to the OR, in my mind, in my opinion, is, is a backwards way of doing it. Now, the specific criteria that I'm alluding to have not been totally hashed out right now, but for example, if you have you know a 65, 68-year-old guy who's got a flail chest and he's got a horrible cough uh, despite having his ribs blocked, um, that patient's not going to do well and they need to get their ribs repaired as soon as possible. I would agree with all of that. Uh, your 37 minutes beats our two or three hour record, uh, but there, there, are, there are cases where patients with significant flail and impending respiratory failure who have no other significant injuries, I think it's appropriate to go ahead and do them uh, immediately. I think we've gotten, I feel like we've gotten uh, we've, we, uh, good at predicting who will fail and who won't, but it's nice to be reminded of that periodically because we fix a lot of people now, so we don't allow people to fail, as Fred mentioned, but once in a while a patient will be sent to us on day five from another institution or, or we'll slip through the cracks over a weekend and we don't find them until they've been here for a couple of days, and, and uh, it's, it's amazingly consistent uh, if they have significant radiographic changes with flail and they have, particularly if they have uh, loss of symmetry and significant chest wall deformity, those patients uh, nearly always fail uh, by whatever, di uh, whatever definition you use. And, and so once in a while we, 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 we have the opportunity to be reminded of what happens when we don't fix patients aggressively. <clears throat> but arguably... Um, Fred and I are aggressive, uh, ag aggressive uh, platers. So, all right, we, we've got a couple uh, infection questions. So, uh, we got a question from Carrie Valdez. She uh, she has a patient who's got seven rib fractures over five ribs. She managed non-operatively. Yesterday, he developed a cough and looks like he has a pneumonia. And she basically says he's failing non-operative management of the rib fractures. But her question is. Should she plate him in the face of this pneumonia? Uh, he's not intubated or septic, or should she treat this and delay the, the rib fixation? And if so, how long would you delay it? I'll go first. Um, this is a very, very uh, relevant question, and it's a challenging one. I don't, I don't think there's a consensus. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to take a patient who's back to remic to the operating room to put hardware in. Uh, 
but uh, a wait, waiting for someone to to uh, complete a full five or seven day course of a- IV antibiotics before you fix them is probably not uh, prudent either if they're if the indications for surgery are strong. So, I in my in that scenario, if the patient uh, could tolerate uh, 48 to 72 hours of of uh, of uh, IV antibiotics without repair, I, that's probably what I would do uh, with the data that you've given me. Yeah, what, one of my favorite things of getting involved in rib repair has been um, learning from both orthopedic and thoracic surgeons it, because the operation is at the complement of those three fields. Um, I knew very little to nothing about how bones heal and plates and screws and you know, not as much as thoracic surgeons about the chest. And it's funny, um, getting in the circles of rib repair and talking to thoracic surgeons, they are not at all worried about chest wall infections. Uh, they say there's tons of muscle there, there's no guts around, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want to the chest and put in whatever you want and it'll never get infected. And um, that even uh, applies to someone who has like an empyema. Now, I don't think I would go that far and you're only as good as your last patient who you had to take the plates out for infection. Uh, but as my practice has evolved, I've been more aggressive with plating patients who have pneumonia um, and even patients who have kind of complicated uh, pleural collections. So I, I agree with Tom that I would get some antibiotics into the patient, and I wouldn't let that get in the way of me uh, repairing the ribs. The goal, obviously, would be to fix the patients uh, to to prevent pneumonia and do it, you know, before they get it. So Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Brian, Brian and Leininger, are you on the line? Uh, okay. Uh, we have another infection question. It's, it's similar. So this is the patient who you plated and develops a significant empyema. Uh, are, are, are you committed to having to go take that hardware out, or are, are you okay leaving it in and just treating them through the empyema? Uh, why don't we let Dave Morris a- answer that question? He's published uh, on this topic. Well, not to butt in here, we we had a few uh, a few infections at my uh, previous institution. Um, we part of it was uh, patients. Most of the time, it was patients who had chest tubes in for a long period of time and maybe already had bacteria floating around. In most of those cases, what we did is we would go and wash them out, um, and then either uh, place antibiotic beads to try to you know uh, again. Uh, building on the foundation that some of the orthopedic literature uh, has demonstrated, put some antibiotic beads in for a period of time, and then with the eventual goal to go back and remove the hardware after the after the fractures had healed. Um, there are patients, though, that you can never remove the, the hardware due to their comorbidities or whatever, and I think we just have to try to suppress them is, is how we managed it. But uh, we clearly don't have the corner on that uh, technique or technology. So. Okay. Uh, we have a, a question from Brian Leininger. He says he uses the, the Synthi system. Sometimes he struggles with the very posteromedial fractures where the medial plate, a, plate edge is almost on the spine. Uh, and he says mobilizing the paraspinous musculature to expose the medial rib segment is often bloody and difficult. And any advice or tips on that? Um. I uh, I don't have a whole lot else to offer other than the couple of things I mentioned. Um, uh, I, I think you can put the plates on the other side, uh, which I know is not common practice now, but I, I do really don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think it's where the technique needs to evolve. Um, and then also I would just question if you're that far back where you're right on the spine, um, if if you should plate it at all, I guess is what I would say. Um, there's a lot of ligamentous support back there, and it's a challenging area, as you mentioned. So there's no magic number, but I think uh, with most of the systems, to get three screws on that medial most fragment, you need a good three to five centimeters. So I kind of use the three centimeter rule um, to say if the fracture is within three centimeters of the lateral border of the transverse process, I just leave it alone. Is it fair to discuss off-label or non-indicated uses of the of the? I'm getting the the positive head shake from Dave here. So, uh, I uh, oftentimes uh, with those very posterior fractures, I will um, uh, s- satisfy myself with two screws because uh, that's all you can get. And so far, knock on wood, we've not had failures. Uh, in doing so, and this, the patients have healed uh, stably. So 
um, I think that's that's another option. And f to to land two screws requires about uh, three centimeters of uh, of clean rib. The 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 uh, the muscle can be elevated, uh, and uh, you can slip the hardware underneath it without dividing it sometimes. But it is a it is a challenge back there. Some patients have have that muscle in spades, and some some it's uh, fairly flimsy. So that's a that's a factor as well. Okay, um, Mark Newell, you uh, still on the line? You have a question? Yes, uh, thank you. You all briefly mentioned gaps between the two segments of ribs. If that gap is too extensive, um, would you consider bone graft? Uh, I would, but it's rare in the acute setting. Uh, you can almost always mobilize the uh, the fractures. Oftentimes, um, my my standard is to is to take one rib at a time, reduce it, and fix it. But sometimes, when there's a significant displacement, you're uh, the, the, a better technique is to is to mobilize and expose all of the ribs, or at least a few of the ribs, and then reduce them it, it, together before you start uh, fixation. And usually, when you do that, you can get the ribs uh, in proximity. But sometimes there's pieces of bone that are missing. I will frequently harvest that bone, the chips that that, uh, that are uh, that are broken off, and use those uh, as a type of bone graft. Uh, but most of the bone grafting I've done has been in the non-union, uh, uh, chronic uh, malunion setting. Fred? Yeah, uh, not a whole lot to add there. I don't have as extensive an experience, but I know that people have published on uh, using uh, bone matrix, using ASIS grafts, using 11th and 12th rib grafts but it's all in the chronic uh, setting. I think it's unusual to need to do it acutely, and, and when you do, it's because a piece is missing that you find in the plural space or the sub Q that you can clean off and just use as a put right back on there. Okay, uh, next question from uh, Wayne Mashas. Wayne, are you there? I am. Go ahead, ask your question. Um, have you performed at any time perioperatively post-discharge pulmonary function testing to identify a presumed versus an actual improvement in patient functionality post-plating? Uh, we have not in, a, in an organized way, but there are, there are investigators, rib surgeons, who are doing that. And um, uh, I guess what I'd say is stay tuned, um, but, but uh, we, we haven't done that in an organized way. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah, neither have we. It's a, it's a great concept. It's an objective way to measure what's going on, and, and there are a couple ongoing studies, so hopefully soon we'll have some better data on that question. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. We're unfortunately out of time. I'm, I bet we could probably keep going with questions for a while here, but uh, unfortunately we don't have, the, don't have the time. Thanks for joining us uh, for this uh, East Masterclass series. Uh, just so you're all aware, uh, we will post this on the web, at least the audio version and the slide deck uh, so it will be available for review later. I want to thank again our, our, our guests, uh, Dr. Tom White and Dr. Fred Paracci. I think uh, your, your experience and your wealth of knowledge came through loud and clear, and thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us uh, today. Uh, also, again, a big, huge thank you to Depew Synthes for uh, supporting this. Uh, this uh, we couldn't do these types of products without support from industry, um, and we want to acknowledge their uh, investment in all of our training and education. So uh, thank you very much to, to Depew. Um, again, uh, if you haven't been to the EAST website, uh, these EAST master classes are underneath the education tab on the EAST home page, and then look for uh, either online education or trauma cast, and there's a link to EAST master classes where you can find this uh, program. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, Matt Martin, my co moderator thanks again uh, for all of your help with this as well. Yeah, Fred and Tom, that was fantastic. Thanks a lot. And, and yeah, we, we could have kept up the questions for another hour, but uh, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun. See you guys. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. All right, everyone. Take care.